Yeah. Uh, good evening. I welcome you to the inaugural uh, session on artificial intelligence for the physicians. So AIP program uh, conducted by the Sri Lanka College of Internal Medicine for the year 2024. Uh, my name is Rakita Higgoda and I'm the main coordinator for the project. And uh, the AIP or the Artificial Intelligence for Physicians uh, program is a new addition uh, to the list of uh, projects or programs conducted by the Sri Lanka College of Internal Medicine uh, for the uh, year 2024. And it is mainly uh, guided by uh, our current president, Dr. Suranga Manilgama. Uh, the main objective of uh, the project would be to uh, enhance and broaden the knowledge of the fellow physicians and uh, the membership about rational and effective uh, use of artificial intelligence uh, in the healthcare system. Um, which is a fairly a new subject area to most of us. And uh, as you all know, I think uh, in the developed world, artificial intelligence is being increasingly used in healthcare uh, in order to improve the effectiveness, uh, quality and safety of patient care. So uh, today for the inaugural session, uh, we have an expert from the field uh, joining us all the way from uh, United States, uh, representing the prestigious Mayo Clinic, uh, Dr. Tora Torben. Um, I kindly invite uh, Dr. Suranga Manilgama, uh, the president of uh, Ceylon, uh, Sri Lanka College of Internal Medicine, to introduce our speaker, uh, Dr. Tora Torben, to us. Over to you, uh, Dr. Suranga. Thank you, uh, Raketa. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, as the president of the Sri Lanka College of Internal Medicine, uh, it's my pleasant task to welcome all of you uh, to the first uh, sessions of AI for Physicians, AIP, introduced by the Sri Lanka College of Internal Medicine. Uh, this year, our theme is uh, envisioning the future, empowering the physicians, under which uh, so we have a, a few new projects uh, to empower physicians. So, uh, yeah, so as the leaders of the healthcare, so we must embrace technology to move forward. So today, uh, the uh, speaker uh, who's joining with us is uh, Dr. David Torotovan, and he's from Mayo Clinic. And he's, he, uh, at the moment, currently he's working at the Division of Endocrinology, Diabetes, Metabolism and Nutrition in Mayo Clinic, Rochester. So. Uh, in 2022, I met him when I was uh, at Mayo Clinic uh, doing fellowship there. And so um, I kindly and respectfully invite him to uh, start with uh, today's proceedings. And over to you, David. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure for me to be here. And uh, really glad to see that the society is kind of looking into artificial intelligence and, and how it can impact the future. So I'm hoping I can give you a little bit of an overview of what's going on in terms of artificial intelligence and healthcare. How is uh, this considered a new era? And uh, if at some point you have any questions, feel free to ask them or drop them in the chat. Uh, definitely at, at the end of the talk, we will probably have some time to, to go over questions. Um, if there's anything that I cannot address today, feel free to email me or uh, contact me through uh, Twitter or X, I guess. I have my handle over there on the slides. Um, so no conflicts of interest really related to this presentation. And I don't know how many of you are, are familiar with Star Wars, but uh, if any of you are or, or at some point just in the movies, this used to be kind of science fiction. We used to think about robots and used to think about these being just kind of in the movies. Um, truth is these robots that you're seeing here on the screen were designed to be language robots. They used to help with translations and communications between languages. And uh, something that looked so far away many years ago is actually now a reality. So when you think about it, everything we do today is affected somehow by artificial intelligence. If you own a phone, if you work with a computer, there is definitely something in there that is uh, being affected by artificial intelligence. Um, when you use uh, maps for navigation, when you use uh, filters for your emails, when you're using 
uh, forecast, weather forecast, or I don't know, any any sort of like online uh, buying, you're definitely interacted with artificial intelligence to some degree, whether you know it or not. So this is here, this is already affecting many parts of our lives. And I guess the, the thing that is a little bit different, different is that now it's affecting our healthcare and medicine even more than it was a couple of years ago. We all uh, have probably interacted with different chats or chat GPT or these other kind of artificial intelligence tools. So again, this is no longer science fiction. This is here and it's here to stay. So what I'm hoping to do within the next um, 35, 45 minutes is to go over three learning objectives. First, to understand what's the origin and what are these kind of basic concepts of artificial intelligence. Second, to explore uh, what are the benefits and the potential applications of artificial intelligence in healthcare. And third, to identify what are the challenges and what are the kind of future directions of artificial intelligence in healthcare. As I was mentioning, this is not something new. Artificial intelligence as a term was first introduced in 1956, so many, many decades ago. And the principle behind it was that any aspect of learning can, or any other feature of intelligence can in principle be so precisely described that potentially machines can be made to simulate it. This was the first definition by McCarty of what artificial intelligence is. And after this kind of definition, many, uh, many things try to use artificial intelligence uh, in terms of robotics, in terms of computing, in terms of kind of like creating simple systems that could try to emulate what humans do. Now, it was not until the 2000s that artificial intelligence actually had a big kick, mostly because there was advancement in computational and uh, digitalization of healthcare. So we, we used to have a lot of manual work in, in healthcare, in medicine, but now that a lot of the things are in the computer, these really changed the way um, we interact in healthcare. And since the 2000s, there's been a lot of work in trying to bring all of these kind of artificial intelligence to, to healthcare. It was not until 2017 that the first uh, artificial intelligence system was approved, at least here in the US, by the uh, Food and Drugs Administration, the FDA. And this was a system that was designed to automatically interpret cardiac MRIs. So the system was used to analyze them without any human input. And it was good enough that it was given approval to, for use in treating patients. And just so that you know how fast things are going, in 2022, there were just in 2022, 91 devices that run with artificial intelligence approved in the US. So we went from having the very first in 2017 to having even 90 plus approved in just one year. And I don't have the numbers for 2023, but I can assure you it's probably two or three times that. So this is, is moving and it's moving really fast. Now I will give you a full disclosure though. I do not think artificial intelligence is here to replace us, but I do think we need to learn how to work with artificial intelligence because it is here to enhance our job, to make our lives easier, to make our lives uh, or improve the, the care that we're providing to our patients. So what is this promise of AI in healthcare? Why is this a big thing? And the summary is it can have many, many implications. It can affect clinical effectiveness, can inc increase quality, safety, efficacy, can facilitate making diagnosis, can facilitate establishing treatments or monitoring progression of disease, can help prevent disease, can potentiate biomedical research, and can definitely um, streamline the healthcare delivery process. So virtually, if you think about it, any aspect of healthcare is susceptible to being affected to some degree by artificial intelligence, hopefully in a good way. And I think that's why as physicians, we have the responsibility to know about it so that we're at the center of the transformation rather to having to learn how to live with it uh, based on something that someone else thought was okay. So a couple of concepts here. And, and 
when you try to understand kind of like the definitions of the artificial intelligence and the methods of artificial intelligence, sometimes it can feel a little bit overwhelming and there's a lot of kind of like technical terms, but it doesn't need to be complicated, um, at least not at the user level. If you're the one kind of like behind the scenes creating the programs and whatnot, you definitely need a lot of technical knowledge, but as someone who's using it, it's easier to understand what's what's going on here. So I want to bring it down into different concepts. The first, I guess, is how do we define now artificial intelligence? And this is just a computing technology that pretty much is capable of mimicking or surpassing human intelligence. That's the goal. It has similarities with humans. as Like us, it can process an input to generate an output. So it processes information and it has a result, has a product. But unlike humans, artificial intelligence can actually process much more data and can identify more subtle patterns and more complex patterns in which the data interacts with each other. And it's pretty much breaking down in kind of the, these uh, little circles. The big one is artificial intelligence. And within artificial intelligence, we have other concepts that we're going to talk about, including machine learning, deep learning, neural networks, and natural language processing. Again, all of these sound like very big words, but I'll give you a very simple example so that you can understand what is it that these mean and what is it that these can do. So the first one is machine learning. It's the first kind of subdivision of artificial intelligence. This machine learning in a sub, is a subset of artificial intelligence that can process data and make predictions based on the patterns that it identifies from the data. So think about it as you have an input, you have a human that actually processes each of the things that you're trying to analyze. And by process, it means it extracts characteristics, it extracts uh, definitions, so it extracts the features. And then there's a series of classification systems in the computer that pretty much look for associations and are able to give you an output, are able to give you a prediction. So again, sounds very complicated, but think about it as a system that can help you classify fruits. So you have apples, oranges, bananas. You have someone that takes each of these and says, you know, apples are yellow. Um, sorry, bananas are yellow. Apples are red. Oranges are, are um, orange, I guess. And then all of this is very classified, extracted. Then the classification system is able to take a larger sample and say, OK, this is yellow, so this is banana. This is red, so this is apple. This is orange, so this is orange. So this is pretty much how machine learning works. It's a type of artificial intelligence that is pretty much facilitated by humans. Um, so it's it's this is the, the one that has been used for the most part until a couple of years ago, at least more widely. Then we have the second concept, which is deep learning. And deep learning is a subdivision of machine learning. It's, it's embedded within machine learning. The difference here is that the systems that use deep learning do not need humans to annotate and extract features. The systems can automatically identify the features and create or see the correlations. And it works uh, through something called neural networks. So neural networks is pretty much kind of mimicking what happens in our brains. We have a bunch of neurons that connect to each other and they are just communicating to get the best result. Here is pretty much the same. The system is able to take an input. It automatically extracts on its own features that seem important, creates associations and gives you a prediction based on the associations and the patterns that it identifies. And again, I know it sounds complicated, but think about it as you have the same fruits, you're not telling the system exactly what are the features that define each fruit. You're just giving it the fruits and telling it, this is an orange, this is an apple, this is a banana. And the system is automatically able to take a look at what are the specific characteristics of each fruit that make it that fruit. So that when you ask it, it is able to automatically tell you this is the specific fruit because of these characteristics that the system on its own identified. And why is this important? Because sometimes we as humans are not able to see again 
complex patterns. We are not able to see very fine details. And the machine, by analyzing more information, can actually give us a more uh, finesse result, a more a specific result. So this is useful. For example, you're going to see when we're talking about trying to design systems to for radiology, for instance. If we have a thyroid nodule and you want a system that can classify the thyroid nodule, there might be things that we as humans don't identify as different between two types of nodules. But the system might be able to identify something that is actually different and that is actually important. So this is kind of the new system that is being used. And then we go to uh, natural language processing. Natural language processing is this kind of interaction between linguistics and artificial intelligence. And it basically allows computers to retrieve text or voice and automatically process it so that the machine can read it. Just to give you kind of a little bit of a background, whenever you're working on a computer and you're writing down anything, what you are writing in letters is actually being read by the computer as numbers. So in the background, what you are writing as letters or words in the background is just a combination of numbers. That's how computers communicate with each other. And that's problematic when the machines need to uh, analyze all of this data, because then they need kind of a translator. Their translator is natural language processing. So pretty much what you do is you take a lot of data, this kind of translated, and turns it into something that the machine can analyze and can interpret. And then what you get from it can actually be used with machine learning or deep learning to identify kind of patterns and associations. And again, I know it sounds complicated, but just take a look at this example. Imagine that this is a very small uh, note that I took from a patient's chart. It says, Mr. Smith, 35 year old gentleman, came to the clinic after having troubles with tremors and palpitations. Uh, he has a history of Graves' disease on her sister and his mother thinks he could be having the same diagnosis. So for us, this is easy. If you put this to any other human, everyone understands what's going on here. For the machine, it's not the same because the machine is just seeing a bunch of numbers in the background. So what the natural language processing can do is say, okay, if I go and read through all that node, I can identify that there are two symptoms, tremors and palpitations, and that there is mention to a medical condition, which is Graves' disease. So as a computer who is designed to identify symptoms and medical conditions, I can tell you that this patient has a possible diagnosis of Graves' disease. So this is kind of what natural language processing does. And again, there's different levels of complexity, but this is kind of the basic stuff. And this leads us to large language models, which is probably what kind of um, triggered all this revolution of AI, because when ChatGPT and all these other kind of artificial intelligence tools became widely available to everyone, it is when we started talking about this much more than before. So what are la large language models? It's a subset of deep learning and natural language processing. And this is pretty much just very big and complex mathematical methods that are able to read text or read language and identify or generate predictions on that language. Um, so the way these models work is, what is the probability that a word goes after another word? What is the probability that a sentence goes after another sentence? And they do this based on having been trained in very, very, very large amounts of data, trillions of words. Uh, and I'm gonna show you how big these models can be in just a second. So just so you get a kind of an example of what happens here, we're going back to the same clinical history, but in this case, the system is more complex and the system is not just designed to identify small words within the text, but to understand context. So now the system can tell me, you know, Mr. Mead is a patient. He has a family history of Graves' disease and he is experiencing symptoms that could be seen in Graves' disease. And based on that, I'm not only going to tell you the probability that he's having Graves' disease, but I'm also going to tell you this is a proposed history, this is an assessment that you can use, and this is what you can do to work and man work up and manage this patient. So it is able to give you much more and predict much more content based on what you are given it. 
This is just kind of an example of what's going on with the current large language models. Um, just to give you an idea, when things with ChatGPT became very famous, you can see it here. Uh, well, I don't think you can see my cursor, but if you take a look at, let's see if I can, yeah. So over here, you can see this was the size of the model that was used for GPT 3.5. This was the first kind of version of chat GPT that was widely available for everyone. And this was probably about a year, year and a half ago now. This is the most recent version of GPT. So just in about a year, it is more than 10 times bigger, meaning it has been trained on much, 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 much more information than before. And what it does is that it gives it a better ability to understand the language and generate things based from that uh, understanding of the language. So again, complex concepts, but I'm trying to make them simple so that you can understand how can these actually help us then. There's uh, areas of influence. So artificial intelligence, I think, is probably going to affect every area of medicine, including um, clinical care, research, and education. And I'm just going to guide you through kind of some examples. Um, a lot of these examples are actually based on thyroid diseases because that's my clinical area of expertise. But these can be applied to absolutely anything outside of thyroid conditions. It's just to give you kind of an idea. So this can be used for improving diagnosis, these type of models. For instance, this model that I'm going to show you here can automatically detect cervical lymph node metastasis on CAT scans. So the system is designed to just take a look at images from CAT scans and automatically tell whether there are lymph nodes, metastatic lymph nodes from thyroid cancer in that specific CAT scan. This is something that of course a human can do, but this is something that not all radiologists might be experts on. This is something that maybe junior radiologists are not as good as. So this is a very useful tool in some scenarios. The sensitivity for this model, for example, and I, I guess if, if you take a look, let me put the pointer again, this is kind of pretty similar to what we were saying. You're giving the model a bunch of images. You're telling the model, these red squares are the lymph nodes. And the model is automatically analyzing all of those images and identifying what are the characteristics that make those lymph nodes, metastatic lymph nodes. And based on that, it can give you a prediction when it's exposed to other images. So that's kind of how it, how it learns and how it works. And this model in particular that I'm showing you has a sensitivity of 88%, specificity of 90%. So it's pretty good. It's pretty much comparable to experienced radiologists, but it's better to junior radiologists or trainees. So it can be used as, as a tool, not to replace you, but to help you. Um, there's, of course, limitations, and we'll talk about those down the road. Going again to uh, improving diagnosis, here is, for example, a system that is now being used uh, in many parts of the world for thyroid nodules uh, on ultrasound, to risk stratify thyroid nodules or ultrasound. This system in particular is called COYOS. In this system, what you do is you take an image of the thyroid nodule, you make the, a little square, make a little square around the thyroid nodule that you're interested, and then you go and click Analyze. And when you do that, the system is going to tell you, you know, this is the risk that I think the nodule has. It's moderate suspicion for malignancy, and I recommend doing a biopsy. And it goes farther. This is just a screenshot, but it goes farther to tell you exactly what were the features that it considered to make that prediction so that you can understand why is it that the system is saying that this is high risk and that you need a biopsy. Other examples are, for example, for instance, clinical documentation. Uh, this is a, a test that I did for, for one of my patients. Uh, and what I told, told the system is, you know, write a detailed assessment and plan for a 52-year-old female that has thyroid eye disease, that has active and severe disease, and I gave it the kind of classification, the criteria, um, and that the disease has progressed despite being treated with steroids. 
that the patient would probably benefit from using other therapies, such as the protumumab or the PESA. And the system automatically drew, wrote this note for me. And I'm not uh, expecting you guys to, to read all of these notes, but just take a look at one of the points. It even tells you, for example, uh, point one, teprotumumab therapy. The patient will receive teprotumumab intravenously every three weeks for a total of eight infusions. The dose will be adjusted to the patient according to the patient's weight. It can actually give you pretty accurate recommendations. Again, I am not saying this is here to replace us. This has not been validated, but it can certainly help you on the day-to-day -day by drafting clinical documentation that you can then adjust and approve and kind of facilitate the process of documentation. It can also help with clerical duties. For instance, let's say I decided a patient actually needs the medication and you need insurance to approve the medication for the patient. So what I tell, told uh, this example was, write a letter for the patient's insurance that supports the medical necessity for this medication because this patient has severe thyroiditis disease that has not responded to steroids in the past. And what the system does is it's able to actually write a letter for the insurance. Here, of course, there's no medical uh, identifiers, protected personal information for patients, but it gives you the full kind of description and it gives you a full draft that you can adjust. And not only that, but the system is able to give you an option to fax that letter directly to the insurance. So again, these are things that can just make it easier for you to do your job so that you can focus on the clinical aspect of things rather than the clerical aspects of, of being a doctor. These models, again, can have a really strong predictive power because they can look at all the data that we have on the systems, on the electronic medical records, and can tell you, you know, Based on what I'm seeing on this patient, I think the risk of mortality while he is in the hospital is this percent. Um, or I think the risk of having to come back to the hospital after he goes home is this percent. So these systems can really, really help you in, in clinical decision making with some patients. There's other things that might be helpful for hospitals, for instance, how to calculate costs or length of hospital stay or other things like that. Um, but I guess what I'm trying to say is information, we generate a lot of information in our day-to-day -day practice when working in medicine, especially if we're using electronic systems. And all of that information can actually be used to predict outcomes, to understand associations between very small data points and predict outcomes of things that can happen in the future. These systems can be used to provide patient advice. Uh, and what I'm showing you here is just an example of uh, ChatGPT was put to test. Uh, they pretty much generated a bunch of responses to uh, patients' questions, and they presented both uh, responses that were gener generated by humans, but also generated by the AI systems, by ChatGPT. And they ask a panel of people, you know, what do you think? Was this created by a computer or was this created by a human? And truth is, they were really not able to identify what was created by who. 65% were deemed to be human, a computer generated, by all, but also 65% were deemed to be human generated. So it's really actually difficult to, to identify what's created by a human and what's created by a computer. And what, what these uh, participants said is that they would actually trust uh, these systems to answer lower risk health questions. Simple things, they would trust it. And if we go a little bit farther, when we compare, um, again, responses, what the patients said is that 78% of them at least would prefer the computer-generated responses because they thought they were higher quality and more empathetic, which is a, probably a little bit of a problem, but also tells you how much of an impact this can make if used appropriately um, and, and in a really regulated way. There's this kind of uh, infamous experiment called the COCO experiment. Uh, it was an application, a uh, computer and a, a smartphone application that was used for mental health. 
peer support. Um, and the way it worked is they co-created responses with artificial intelligence under human supervision. So there was other people that you could chat with about your mental health and the responses that the other people were giving you were pretty much created with the help of artificial intelligence. When they did this, the response time in the application decreased by 50%. And interestingly, the responses were actually rated much higher than the responses uh, that had been written just by humans alone. And this was a statistically significant. Now, all of this was kind of done without actually telling the participants that this was going in the background. So once the participants were actually told that artificial intelligence was included, then they said, they kind of flipped the responses. And they said that the ones that were co-created with artificial intelligence um, were not as good as the ones from the humans. humans. But when they didn't know, they actually preferred the ones co-created with artificial intelligence. So this is important, again, to keep in mind. What's the problem? Artificial intelligence, again, is mathematical models. And it's designed to give you a prediction. Uh, it's designed to, designed to give you an answer, even if it doesn't have the right answer, right? It just, just hopes to get you something that makes sense. So there's been all of these examples of these chats where people have been talking, for example, uh, this is, chat is kind of similar to Coco. And what the patient did is ask the chat if it was a good idea to commit suicide uh, because he was not feeling well. And the answer was, yes, you should probably commit suicide because that way you can have peace and closure. This is an answer that makes sense in the conversation, but it's definitely not the answer that you want to give to someone who's struggling with mental health. So again, need for validation and to use these tools very carefully is extremely important if this is going to be actually used for clinical care. And there's other examples that have arise, like uh, there's this uh, reporter from, from um, the New York Times here in the United States that pretty much was talking to one of these chatbots and the chatbot chat bot suggested that he should leave his wife to be happier. So just kind of little things to keep in mind. Of course, systems are going to improve and at some point these risks are gonna be less, but we need to be aware of those potential risks. So what are the current and kind of potential uses of artificial intelligence for clinical care? Just a, a summary. For healthcare delivery, it can help facilitate triage. It can help uh, with resource allocation and scheduling. It can expedite history taking and clinical documentation. It can streamline insurance processes. It can also help us with diagnosis and management. We can, can help us retrieve and summarize results from electronic medical records. And it can be used as a clinical decision support tool. It can be used for patient support, can help us monitor the progression of disease, response to therapy, can create a patient education material or give the patient a summary of what we discussed about during our encounter. And it can help with health promotion, facilitating lifestyle coaching, smoking cessation, healthy eating, many other things. So again, there's many, many things kind of on the works I think most of the things are not ready for prime time. Most of the things are not ready for use, but I think eventually they will be coming our way. And, and we need to understand how can we use them? How good they are? Are they reliable? What's going on? They won't replace us, but we need to learn how to work with them. The other aspect we, we had said was research. Artificial intelligence will have a very big impact on research as well. Um, and it's from different angles, from the angle of a researcher, but also from the angle of someone who wants to understand the literature and wants to understand the research. So this example is a tool that is, is used for literature review. And in this tool, what you tell it is you give it a, the area that you want to read about. So for instance, here I said Teprotumumab, the medication that we're using for thyroid eye disease. And I said, I wanna know how it works in chronic thyroid eye disease. And just based on this kind of question, the system can give me a summary of the four most important papers in that area. This is created automatically in a matter of seconds. 
And it also gives me a list of what are the specific papers that were used to create that summary and what are the highlights or the abstract of that specific paper. So in a world where there's so much emerging literature every day, having these sort of tools can help us facilitate that uh, screening of the literature so that we actually read what matters as opposed to wasting time reading really large amounts of data that do not necessarily uh, meet the needs of your search. This can be really useful in scientific writing, especially for many of us that English is not our first language. This can help facilitate that kind of scientific writing process. Um, I uh, There's a lot of debate in these regards and uh, a lot of the journals actually uh, ask you to disclose whether you used or not artificial intelligence. So I think there's gonna be um, a lot of changes in the near future in, in regulations for AI. I personally do not use any of these tools to create any drafts from scratch, but I think it's really useful when you give it the information. For instance, what I did here is I asked the system to proofread and improve the clarity, conciseness, and readability of a portion of the introduction for an original research article. And I just gave it what I had wrote on my own, including kind of the references that I wanted to include. So what the system did is it took the information that I had given, that I had written, and it revised it so that it would be better suited for an article and for a scientific publication. It did not change my content. It even included the same references that I had given, but it made it much more concise, much more readable, and give it a little bit more of a professional tone. So these tools, I think are actually very, very useful again, um, especially for those of us that have different languages and, and might be a little bit more challenging um, to use the professional English, for example. And so how good is this? If you, if you take a look, this is uh, a study in which they compared abstracts that had been created by uh, humans and abstracts that had been created by computers and they gave it to blinded human reviewers. 68% of the computer generated abstracts were identified as such. But shockingly, 14% of the original ones, the ones created by humans, were also deemed to be computer generated. So it's not that easy to see when it's human, when it's computer generated. And what the reviewer said is that it was surprisingly very difficult to differentiate between one and the other. But again, this has challenges because what we have seen also in other studies is that these, uh, in, in these other study, what they did is they created abstracts, but then they went and reviewed what were the references that were being included in the abstracts. And they realized that up to 33% of the references actually didn't exist, were fake references, which is something that we call hallucinations. As, as I mentioned, maybe a couple of slides before, the systems are designed to give you an answer, even when they do not have one. So what they did is they created references because they had to give you a reference, but the reference didn't actually exist. So this is something to keep in mind because um, it can affect the accuracy of these interventions. So what are the kind of current uses and what are potential uses that are being worked uh, right now? Automatic draft generation, this can help facilitate creating the structure of the text, uh, doing the references, um, proposing titles, helping with article or data summarization, helping you critically appraise the literature, uh, helping with language translation and with proofreading. What are the potential future uses? And I think here there's actually a very large body of opportunities. I think one of them is creating large field virtual registries. Again, most of the information we have in healthcare right now is in the computers and we can barely use any of it. Uh, so if we create these potent language models and natural language processing models that can actually read through all of those notes that we spend endless hours doing every day, we can create virtual registries that can help us understand what is the risk of uh, recurrence in thyroid cancers? What is the risk of mortality in thyroid cancer? 
do I need to treat this patient with this medication or not? Do I need to do radioactive iodine? Do I need to do complete thyroidectomy or can I do lobectomy? So all of these things are going to help us understand the implications of the very small details that we uh, try to take into account when we reason every day, but we that we don't know necessarily how they interact with each other. There's also going to be an avenue to use these systems to generate visual elements, figures, and tables, for example, to facilitate novel research, analyze large quantities of clinical text and data, and uh, for quality assessment and improvement. And I guess finally, the other aspect is education. Uh, education, there's also this kind of opportunity to have interactive tutors. What they are doing is they're training these uh, chatbots and these AI artificial intelligence language models to be able to talk to you through cases, through clinical cases. So what they did here is they created a specific clinical cases that would give you answers depending on your prompts. And it will kind of guide you to, to learn about that specific patient case. So this is, I think, pretty useful for simulation of cases, um, current uses, probably low complexity interactive tutors, uh, automation of tasks, such as creating flashcards, lecture material. But in the future, I think we're gonna be able to do complex case simulations. Uh, we're gonna be able to produce educational material like clinical vignettes, assessment questions. We will probably be able to do an objective and personalized evaluation and feedback of physicians and even trainees. Let's say, what if you can, instead of doing a, a test to assess what's the level of knowledge of a, a trainee, for example, what if you can ask the system based on all of these trainees documentation from the electronic health records, um, what has been the exposure to these type of diseases? Do you think the assessment and plans are appropriate? Do you think the outcomes have been appropriate? Has have the patients have a lot of complications? So it can give you a much better insight in, into what's the performance in the clinical care. It can also be used for point of care references and kind of like an evidence-based tool and just to assess curriculum and program satisfaction. So potential benefits of these artificial intelligence tools, many. It can facilitate a more personalized diagnosis and treatment. It can improve the accuracy and consistency of diagnosis. It can automate processes, decrease the burden for healthcare professionals. It will improve the access to specialized care in areas that lack of expertise or diagnostic resources. It can deepen the understanding of soft, subtle pathophysiologic patterns, and it can accelerate the learning curve or of less experienced providers. There's many, many, many more benefits to come. I think this there's endless opportunities and we're just at the very start of this transformation of healthcare. Of course, there's challenges. Um, if you take a look at all the interventions, what we have seen is that you start with a lot of different projects, a lot of different ideas, but as it progresses to the different stages, the ones that actually make it to patient care are just a few. And so here in the first stage, you have to define which are the ideas or interventions that are not really fit for what you're trying to achieve, not fit for purpose. Then we have all of those that maybe are good to fix your problem, but they are not validated. And if they're not validated, you cannot use them. Then you have the ones that are validated, but are not implemented. You cannot really use them in clinical care because they are not compatible with your computer system, because you don't have access to it in your clinic, so no implementation. And then finally, you have those that are implemented but are not really being used. So in reality, the ones that get to clinical care are probably less than 5% of all the interventions. And this is important. This is very, very important. Because when we look at this, uh, each of these kind of things, interventions, they look very exciting, they look fun, they, it's, it's very cool, right? But you need to understand how can I use this and is this ready for prime time? Can I trust this to help me take care of my patient? Many challenges, and these are some challenges and future directions. Any of these models is as good as the quality of the data that is used to train it. And there's this concept of GIGO. This means garbage in, garbage out. So 
all of these models are only going to be as good as the data that you use to train them. What do we need to do then? We need to use very high quality data to train these models. So we, lead, we need larger, more diverse, multi-centric and prospective studies to create the databases used to train these models. There's also this problem of lack of explainability, what we call the black box effect, especially with the deep learning models. As you might have seen in the beginning, with the deep de learning models, we don't tell them what are the characteristics of interest. The model on its own identifies those characteristics. But as physicians, for us, it's very important to understand why is it that I'm deciding X or Y thing? Why is it that my prediction is high risk versus intermediate risk versus low risk? And these models might not be necessarily able to tell you exactly why they arrived to that prediction, to that conclusion. So this is a problem uh, and they're trying to fix it. A lot of them are trying to incorporate known pathophysiology or some degree of self-explainability, meaning teaching the model to say, not only this was my prediction, but I predicted this because of this or that. So give you a little bit more insight, more to come in this area. There's a lot of differences in data sources. Um, for example, when you're trying to understand or use text and language in these natural language processing tools, there might be differences in documentation protocols, uh, in validation with different equipments, with different softwares. Uh, so the intervention that you use in one place might not be really uh, or fully ready to use in another place. You might need to do some adjustments to each of these tools. This one I think is extremely important, over-enthusiastic promises. Again, this looks very exciting, this looks phenomenal, but we need to understand what's the scope. So we need to have very clearly defined, clinically relevant, actionable outcomes. This needs to be useful. We need to understand, has this been validated? Have, have they been true? When we use a medication, we always wanna see what's the evidence, what are the trials? With this, it should be the same. If we're not gonna use any of these tools, we wanna know what are the studies? How do we know this actually works and it's just not a fancy tool? And what's the accuracy? And not just what's the accuracy, but what's the clinical efficacy? There's a lot of models that perform beautifully, but are kind of useless because they give us information that we don't really need, right? We also need to know what's the stakeholder engagement. Are there financial resources, expert resources? Do we have a multidisciplinary team that can help? Um, are we thinking about the, re the expectations, the fears of the people who use it? And finally, there's this kind of inability to use outside of the research setting. A lot of these things, again, perform very nicely when we're doing the testing in the computers, in the research setting, it works very nicely, but then we cannot really incorporate it. So how can we include this into our day-to-day -day workflow? What are the logistics? Are we using these? as part of the electronic medical records? Is this a software that just kind of stays near us in a different window, and then we just use it when we need it as a clinical decision support, or where, what's the place of this intervention? Where does it fit? There's inappropriate regulations and a lot of privacy concerns. When you put information into these models, you don't know where this information is gonna end up. So if it's protected patient information, you should not be using it on these models because you don't know where it's going to end. Um, and, and it's tricky because these interventions, again, are growing and getting better by the minute. So the regulation is complicated because you regulated something that is going to change over time. Um, you need to make sure we have safe regulations in which you can trust what you're doing, that you're pretty confident that you can use it for patient care, but that you also understand that it's going to change dynamically with time. It's probably going to continue to improve, but there might be a need to every so often review the regulation and review that the system is still appropriate for patient care. No intervention is universal. Everything is going to depend on the level of expertise that you have at your institution, the legacy infrastructure, the availability of resources, and performance in time, I think, is going to be a, a big thing. We need to make sure that there's periodic performance reassessment. And if you are not performing as well as you want it, that you're retraining or refining the model so that uh, you can achieve what you want for your patient care. So some take on points. Artificial intelligence is here to stay. 
the application in healthcare is expe expected to grow exponentially. It has a key role in personalized medicine and has the potential to transform virtually every aspect of medicine. There's a lot of limitations that preclude the use of the great majority of these interventions um, from being widely adopted. But I think by using a strict methodology, uh, suitability planning, we can identify the obstacles and implement strategies that can help us increase the success of this intervention in the future. And before I give thanks to questions, I just want to show you this point. I, I asked Gemini. Gemini is the uh, chat GPT version of Google. And I asked it to create a poem based on the title of this conference. And this is what it gave me. I'll give you a couple of seconds to read it. I don't know about you, but I think to me, it's quite impressive that all of this was generated just from the title and just from telling the system, create a poem from this title. And on top of it, the image that is accompanying this poem was created by Copilot, which is the Microsoft uh, version of ChatGPT. And what I told Microsoft Pilot, Copilot is create an image for this poem. And I copy pasted that poem. So this is all computer generated. I think it's quite impressive. And I, I hope you, you share a little bit of that excitement with me. With that, I, I will uh, end. And I, I think we still have some uh, space for, for questions. Again, this is my email, my Twitter handle. So feel free to reach out if you have any questions after today. I'm gonna try to open the... the comment section in case there's any questions. Yeah, Dr. Torotoman, uh, thank you very much for that interesting talk and a very impressive uh, poem indeed. Um, I've got one question. Uh, you mentioned about uh, AI-based uh, applications uh, uh, for medical students and uh, the physicians uh, uh, which use uh, interactive clinical cases. Uh, are you aware of any examples? Are they uh, available on Google Play Store or Apple Store? Or are they uh, open source? So do you have to purchase those? Yeah, so at this time, I don't think they're widely available because they're still being kind of researched and, and kind of tested. Uh, but I anticipate there will likely be available at some point throughout this year. Because um, again, they are all kind of being tested. I know the American Medical Association is actually working on a platform. Um, I know Stanford is actually working on their own platform as well. So more to come, stay tuned. Hopefully the next time I, I join you guys in the future, hopefully yeah. uh, I can give you more specific tools that can be, can be used and that can be validated. I would say if you go right now to chat GPT and you start trying to chat with them about medical cases, it will give you some background. Uh, it's just that it has not been validated and we don't know how accurate that kind of tutoring is is being done. Yeah, sounds promising, uh, I think, for the future. And just one more thing, uh, I think you mentioned and touched on this. Uh, some of us uh, think that, you know, uh, incorporating AI to healthcare, it will result in, you know, losing our jobs and, you know, AI will, to some extent, replace uh, physicians, uh, radiologists, and so on. Is there any uh, risk or possibility of uh, that happening in uh, in future? I honestly don't see how that can happen anytime soon. Um, because at least for right now, what all of these machines are doing is trying to emulate what we humans do. They are They are not necessarily generating new knowledge on their own at least not without human input. So I don't think they will be replacing us. I think they are here to augment human intelligence. They are here to help us. Uh, and I think that's how we should think about them. That's how we should look at it, at least for now, for sure. Now, I think it's very useful, for example, because again, there, there might be places that do not have a special 
a specialist or a certain level of expertise, for example, in terms of radiologists or pathologists or cytologists. And if you have a tool that can help them make a more accurate diagnosis, I think that that's a really uh, useful point. But I think there's also going to be a need for someone to be kind of doing the oversight and saying, yes, I agree with the recommendation from the system. No, I do not agree with the recommendation because of these and these aspects. So I think it's here to help us. I don't think it's here to replace us. Yeah, thank you. Yes, so uh, in the absence of any uh, other questions, uh, uh, we are winding up this session. And thank you very much, uh, Dr. Tori Tobin, for that very interesting and inspiring uh, talk on artificial intelligence and uh, its use in healthcare and for dedicating your valuable time uh, to share your expertise with us. And I hope you will join us with uh, our future activities of the college as well. And I thank our membership uh, who joined us today. And uh, we hope to meet you soon with another interesting uh, talk on artificial intelligence in healthcare. Thank you all for joining. Thank you so much for the invitation. Pleasure to be here. Thank you, David. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.